Joseph, welcome to today's episode of Strategy Simplified. I'm so excited to be having this conversation in public. We've known each other for what seems like years and years, and I'm excited to bring some of our conversations uh, out into the public forum for the benefit of hopefully the entire management consulted community. Where does this call find you today? Well, I'm here over in Falls Church, Virginia. That's where I live, um, though I work in D.C., so I'm able to work remotely today. Wonderful. Hey, Joseph, our team wrote a short bio for you that I wanted to read uh, for the audience and for you. Uh, So let me just introduce you to everybody and then we can dive right in. So Joseph Miranda is the Consulting 360 Program Manager at the George Washington School of Business. He comes to GWSB from an IT consulting career of 28 years with Accenture, where he held a number of executive leadership roles and retired as the Director of Operations for Corporate Development and Global Operations. Joseph has worked in the commercial and federal industries and has expertise in operations, finance, M&A, pricing, project management, corporate development, and career counseling. Now, Joseph's focus is on business school students targeting a career in the consulting industry, And I can tell you firsthand that he is committed to preparing students with the skills and knowledge required to improve their market readiness and increase their success in this industry. Again, Joseph, welcome. Really excited to have you today. Oh, thanks, Damon. I'm really excited to be here today. So you work with students year round to prepare them for consulting recruiting and case interviews. Uh, And to that end, you spearhead what I would call an innovative program at the George Washington School of Business called Consulting 360. Can you talk to us about what the program is and how it helps prepare students for consulting. Uh, Sure, Naman. The program is really geared toward any student, um, undergrad and graduate, though the program is pretty much 65 to 75% graduate students, but it, it does allow both to join. And it's focused on any student that has an interest in pursuing a career in consulting. And the way we've structured it is there's kind of two levels to it. Uh, There'll be one through the fall and then one in the spring. And and it builds, the program builds on 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 each level that the student, and the students have to achieve a certain requirements in order to progress and advance to the spring level. Because the spring level is where it takes what they've learned and actually hones it and puts it into practice which drives the whole day one market ready aspect of our program, which I'm sure we're going to get to in a little while. So the two levels are really important, but the program, when I, let me step back a second and give you a little background. You know, I retired about a year and a half ago from Accenture, uh, came to George GW. This was an existing program. We've recently rebranded it Consulting 360. uh, And it had some good bones, right? but it was really focused on introduction to consulting, building some of their industry knowledge and interviewing, right? And and that's important, very important, especially for a career center. But one of the things I noticed, it didn't really have a good future vision. And it's very important to interview well and get a job, but from a company's perspective, When that student crosses the threshold and becomes an employee, it's a different world. There's a different set of expectations for the student. So what we really did is try to build on that. So the program is supported by four pillars, just as four pillars uh, support building, the program is supported by four pillars. The first pillar is increasing industry knowledge. That continues throughout, but we really do a heavy lifting on introducing the students and building their industry knowledge in that first fall semester. And we do that through a number of ways, through workshops, we have industry leaders, many of them, and most of them are alumni that put on those those workshops that get them understanding a little bit about the landscape of management consulting, uh, what areas of management consulting they could get into, right? They can get into strategy. They might get into operations, maybe technology, maybe the federal side versus the commercial side. So really introducing them to a lot of a lot of management consulting and what does it mean to be a management consulting? Um, we also have uh, a workshops on building their analytical skills and how do you look at a problem? How do how does a consultant really 
take that problem and kind of figure out a solution. And we have, we're very fortunate to have a former McKinsey partner do, do that workshop. Uh, and uh, so that's pillar one, that's increasing industry knowledge, very heavily focused in the first. Second pillar that we have is navigating career paths. And that's where there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching I do with the students. The, work sh the whole program is built so they can even navigate through the program right? There's 40 something workshops that comprise really the first fall semester. So students that are really focused and know, well, I want this type of consulting role, or I want that type of consulting role, and I need help in this area can, can even navigate through the program in a way that best suits them. So we try to meet the, the, the students where they're at. If a student has no idea, they can avail themselves to plethora of courses you know, that we have and workshops that we have available to them. So that's navigating career paths. And also part of that one is really an important factor, but they have to advance in the spring to get this. We have pro bono internships. We had 10 of them last year and they get a chance to really put into practice a lot of what they've learned. And uh, I'd like to go in that in more detail in a moment, but let me finish the overview. Uh, the next the next pillar we have is really networking. Now they're networking throughout, right? They have industry leaders giving these workshops. They're going to get to interact with them, build a rapport with them, uh, find out more about their companies and opportunities. Uh, they have, we have a series I instituted for executive consulting speaker series. So we've brought in CFOs, vice presidents, um, entrepreneurs, and others to come talk to the students and tell them about their career path, whether they were alumni or not, um, give them some stories about how they progressed up through their organizations, and also what is most important in those organizations today for students like them coming into the organization and what do they expect, right, from them. So that's, that's, the, that's the networking is that third pillar. And then the fourth pillar is the interviewing and career prep. So that's all of, the, all of the behavioral case interview. We do a lot of workshops, deep dives on that. We have former BCG alumni that do, those, do that as well as former McKinsey. I do it as well myself. So I can do one-on-one -on -one with students uh, in, in addition to the workshops. So we, we really help them on the interviewing. But then that's that career prep as well. And that's where we've built on to the program that kind of polishing the stone, right? When they work, walk through the door day one. So we have instituted workshops on executive presence. You know, executive presence can account for up to 20, 25% of a promotion decision. It's very important. Effective presentation skills. That's kind of lost today in the virtual world, right? Since, since most of work is being done virtually, but there is techniques to, in, to be able to present effectively virtually and in person. So we do teach them how to do that. Professional etiquette. This is one thing I saw a lot of students lacked when they came into Accenture where I worked. So we try to have, um, we have a workshop that gives them the tools they need and the awareness they need of how to behave in certain situations, right? What are, what are ways to avoid those early stumbles in your career that can stunt your career at a particular company, especially if you stumble in front of the wrong person, and be able to have a successful, you know, first 90, 180, and year at your company, right, to get you off on the right foot. So we have these four pillars that really support it, and there's a lot of detail underneath it. So I'm happy to get into any any area you'd like to. That's a really, really helpful overview, Joseph. Uh, I've got a couple follow-ups to that. The yeah. first, is there a pillar out of the four that you find students underestimate or that uh, is most surprisingly helpful to their overall progress that maybe the broader consulting community should be aware of as they're planning their own recruiting prep? Yeah, you know, the one I think that is very underestimated by students is the career prep. That's different than the interviewing prep. They're, they all come and they're all ready to try to learn how to interview well. They're all ready to learn about the industry or already have some knowledge of the industry. 
they all are understand the importance of networking. Now they all may not be that good at it, right? Because it's it's not an easy thing to do. It's easy to talk about, hard to put into practice. Absolutely. And they but they understand the importance of it, right? The the thing they they don't realize are those areas that they need to polish in order to be able to stand out when they get to the their employer. Let me give you an example. Uh, I had hired a young a young person out of college, undergrad. Uh, I think it was the first person from this particular university that I hired. This individual just knocked everybody's socks off. Uh, came in, was very, communicated very well, was always anxious to take on new work, suggested ways to for innovation in what they were doing, not changing the company, but changing and improving what they were doing. And they just stood out immediately and they were very good at the blocking and tackling of their job as well. Now that made a great impression on everybody. That young person was identified and is going to be a fast mover. But what it also put in the mind of myself was Wow, if I see another resume from someone from that university, I'm going to pay attention to it. If that's if that's an example of the type of professional they're producing, then we want more of that, right? And that's where I think the students underestimate the value of, you know, being able to be a good communicator, understanding executive presence. They don't have to be experts in any of this stuff, right? being able to understand how do you host, how do you attend, what's expected uh, for you in certain uh, in certain situations, business travel, client client meals, et cetera, right? And uh, we're also adding entrepreneurial mindset. That's important, how to be an innovator, an entrepreneur in what you do, taking ownership of your, of your job, and then negotiations, an introduction to negotiations. These things are not really in the radar uh, necessarily of most of the students, but it's very undervalued by students, I believe, but adds the most value after they get the offer. Joseph, that really confirms what I'm hearing from our employer and our corporate partners. Uh, I spend a lot of my day-to-day working with our corporate partners, helping them put learning and development and training plans together for their teams. And the number one skill that they tell me their teams lack is the ability to effectively communicate. And so a lot of my days and my weeks are spent uh, training teams inside of consulting and just in the Fortune 2000 on effective presentation and communication skills. And to your point, if you can walk in day one with those skills already, how much faster are you going to be promoted and stand out compared to your peers? Uh, A couple of other Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, what it brought to mind, Naman, is that uh, one of the things that I, I really try to make sure gets across to our students is the fact that, you know, when you're at university, there's a lot of hand holding, right? Your advisors, your career centers, everything's right. And I try to very much impart to them that when you walk into the door of your new employer, there's nobody waiting to put their arm around your neck saying, I, I got you covered. Your promotion is going to be in this many months. And here's what you have to train on. And here's what you've got to do. And I'll tell you what to say. No one's waiting for you. And the just as much effort you put into finding a career and getting and securing that first job, you're going to be doing in a different way throughout your career. You're going to be networking to get your next assignment. You're going to be networking to build a stronger sense of mentors that help train you and teach you and advise you that will last you a lifetime, right? So yeah, it doesn't surprise me that you hear a lot of that. Um, So there's something else I'll get to later, I'm sure, but uh, go ahead. You were going to say something. Well, I was going to ask you, the other two pillars that you mentioned outside of the presentation skills were executive presence, uh, and then you also mentioned etiquette. And uh, let's start with executive presence. I think a lot of people have their own definition of what executive presence means. So how do you define it? And then how do you specifically help students build that? Yeah. So like you said, you can. there are lots of definitions everyone has, right? What I try to communicate to the students is there are different characteristics that 
communicate executive presence. And the importance of that is, is a company may have a company view, but within the company, you have leaders that have their own view of executive presence, right? We've all worked with different leaders and they're not the same, but they have executive presence, right? So, so it's interesting, right? They have whole different styles. It's not like a robots that they all show the same characteristics as executive presence. They can maintain their true self and their, but they, they have a different way of approaching situations, right? So it, it has a lot to do with, um, your demeanor, right? Do you, are you confident? Do you exude confidence? Uh, are you, can you influence? Now there's lots of layers to this. We can't train them to be perfect in, in it, but you know, do you demonstrate that confidence? Um, are you a good listener? I mean, that's a key in consulting. Um, and I've got a great story I can tell you if you want later, but are you a good listener, an active listener? right? Um, what's your brand, right? How do you come across? Right? You, you've heard the old adage, right? Dress for the level you want to get to. And there's lots of folks who say dress for the level above the level you want to get to, right? But there's something to that. I mean, you don't have to go out and buy the most expensive wardrobe, and, but you do have to be professional, right? You do have to show up to meetings on time. You do have to have your video on when you're at meetings. You can't get flustered in stressful situations. You need to be able to respond in a positive way. You're not faking it. We're not telling you to lie, but you have to be able to deal with tough questions, stressful situations. You have to be able to lead a team during very difficult times, whether there is a delay in the project, um, you have to be able to help uh, determine what are the cause of issues in a calm manner without accusation, finger pointing, yelling, screaming, all of those things, right? So if you have all of those kinds of features or characteristics, you're gonna demonstrate a strong executive presence. Right? It looks different for everybody because we all have a different way of approaching it. Right? And uh, I, I always consider myself in leading teams as the chief obstacle remover. Right, That was my role. If my team had an obstacle in their way, I needed to remove it so they could do their jobs. And I gave them the, the autonomy to do their jobs and they knew what was expected of them. But it comes with clarity of, of what their role is. Right, making sure that you're there to clearly define it and be responsive to them. I think that's one of my favorite definitions of leadership that I've heard. Chief obstacle remover. I might have to steal that, but <laughs> right. I I one hundred percent agree with you that that good leaders have that in common. And the thread that I was following and, and picking up on as you were describing executive presence is just a, a well-rounded competence. Uh, and I think the confidence that you mentioned early on in your description of executive presence comes from uh, a, a confidence in your competence and that you've been trained to do the work that you're doing. Uh, and it sounds like GW is doing a really good job of giving students that competence, which then leads to that confidence. Yeah. And here's another thing you know that leads to that, that contributes to that as they, if they start off well, and remember what I talked about, right? It's at GW, right, these programs, Consulting 360 being one of them, are industry-focused programs to build well-rounded day one professionals. So what does day one market-ready professionals mean, right? Well, part of contributing to that and part of contributing to building that competence is what I, one of the things I tell the students, I say, build a skyscraper. Now, this sounds a lot like um, Be a Goldfish from Ted Lasso, but it came way before Ted Lasso, so I didn't <laughs> steal the concept. Uh, but I tell them, build a skyscraper. And what do I mean by that? If you ever go, if you're ever in New York or San Francisco or Chicago, any big city, right, with big, tall buildings, they dig really deep first, don't they? Before they start building floors. Same thing I tell them. You need to build, dig your foundations deep, learn your trade learn your company's services offerings build your mentor you know your mentor group right. 
be the best you can be and learn. And when you're new, you have a certain number of months, maybe three months, where you can ask any question. Don't leave a question unanswered, unasked that you don't know. You build that foundation deep and strong and well, you can build floor after floor and go as high as you want in your career, right? And that's where the, when you have that confidence and that knowledge, when you have that knowledge, that big, deep well of knowledge, yes, you're, you're going to be confident in what you know, and you're going to be valuable and contribute to any discussion. I think that's also motivating for folks when they're in the foundation laying phase of their career is that it's not just laying a foundation for the sake of laying a foundation. It's so that you can build on it for the decades and decades to come. And the deeper the foundation goes, like you said, the taller the building rises. That's right. Is there another example, Joseph, of uh, a day one market ready professional and some of the characteristics that they exhibit, maybe some characteristics that we haven't yet discussed? Yes. So part of the program, especially for those that advance to the second tier, the second level in the spring, right? There's a number of things we do that gets to what your, your exact question. One, we pair every one of them up individually with an industry mentor. Now this, this can be an alum or it can be someone who wants to help students that's in industry. So they have, they have access to someone that they can reach out to and get advice and build a network with throughout the spring. And hopefully that continues beyond. Secondly, that's where we have that speaker series, the, the executive speaker series. So they get to hear firsthand and they get to network with those individuals as well. You don't very, you know, get often at that level to be able to have a conversation with someone in the C-suite of a company, right? So that's valuable. But the biggest thing is now they've had that fall, they've had all those workshops. Um, the spring, they get paired up with mentors. They're going through all of that executive presence, effective presentations, professional etiquette, entrepreneurial mindset, et cetera, negotiations. Then they also are take part in pro bono internships. And that's where they put it into practice and they run it. There, you know, there'll be a project manager, a student project manager, I mean, I'm always here as a sounding board, as kind of, you know, oversight, if they need anything, chief obstacle remover, right? And, but they're the ones that set the cadence of, of calls with the client. They build the deliverables and presentations to the client, and they deliver the final deliverable to the client. And I've been real fortunate to kind of sit in on those final uh, deliverables and, you know, when you give someone, well, first of all, it takes a lot of time to match up the right people to the right project. But assuming you do that well, you're, it's amazing how they put into practice those things we've taught about. Are they perfect? No. But boy, are they, do, do the clients find them remarkable? It's one thing to go through a workshop series to meet with professionals. It's another thing for the rubber to meet the road and to actually apply what you've learned. And I would assume, Joseph, that beyond the hard skills and the, and the analytical skills that almost every student these days possesses, I would think that the ability to manage a client relationship, to uh, be structured and prioritized in your analysis, to be clear and concise and persuasive in your communication are some of the professional outcomes that come from those projects. Are there others that I'm missing that students really take away from that experience? Uh, they, they take away a lot, right? There's, they take away not only those things we just talked about and that you just mentioned. And a lot of times, you know, that's kind of the guidance I help them with on my one-on-ones with the project manager, with the team, right? Making sure that they're they're working with the client effectively and and managing that relationship. Uh, and I check in with the clients periodically, just make sure they're they're happy and how they they feel with it. But also, I do like when the students find a difficult challenge in the project because you learn more from kind of those things that are the hardest than you do for those things that that seem to be easier, right? And you learn also how to deal with 
managing multiple, you know, juggling multiple balls, right? Because they're students. They've got, you know, they've got their full-time academics. They're also doing a pro bono project. They're also attending workshops um, and they may have extracurricular activities. Some of them are athletes. Some of them are presidents of clubs. Um, so they're, they're learning a lot about what it takes to be a consultant. And one of the things I always communicate to them, especially when they seem to have, um, seem to be a little frustrated or, or, you know, in, and how to deal with, you know, managing multiple, uh, pro multiple, uh, competing, uh, events at the same time is I try to tell them, look, you're experiencing exactly what consultants experience, because not only are you going to have your project, but you may be assigned an internal project that you have to work on. You may be, a, you may be called in to advise uh, a team on a, in another project. You're going to have to learn how to juggle and manage that. And, and I'm, I help them develop those skills, right? So those are things that come out of these experiences that I, I think are more valuable than sometimes the credit hours they get on just taking a course. Is there an example you can share or one that comes to mind of real world client impact that one of those projects has wrought? Sure, sure. Um, I can't go into extreme detail about the project, but one of our teams um, a year ago did a project for a well-known company uh, it dealt with infrastructure. And I believe they were looking at um, a kind of mid-Atlantic area um, county in a state in the mid-Atlantic and looking at developing um, light commuter uh, transportation, et cetera, right? And they had come up with an approach and an analysis and a recommendation that the company actually took and is building a business off of. Wow. Right? And it's implementing that. That's one. The, the um, Another is we had uh, this past spring a group of students helping out on a social media strategy for a fairly new company. And... You know, fairly new companies run by entrepreneurs are, you know, run by them and their family members, right? So it's really hard for them to do it. So the, the, the students did an amazing job analyzing the data. So data mining, what was, what, what was on there? So that social media platform, when, when, what was resonating most with with subscribers, when was it resonating most? When did you post certain content? And then strategies to improve and increase subscriptions. And the 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 client was floored and was definitely going to put a number of those things into into practice. So it's also kind of unleashing the creativity of this younger generation, they get a lot of grief, the younger generation at time, but they're, there's, they're definitely not short on creativity, that's for sure. And if you, if you give them the confidence and the trust, I think they're gonna show you quite a bit, and the tools, of course, uh, I think they're gonna surprise you. From personal experience, I heartily agree. Uh, and speaking of the younger generation and, and Gen Z, I recently saw an article in the Wall Street Journal that was talking about how young professionals, often in their first roles, uh, are struggling with business etiquette. And it's just really interesting to me that's, that that is one of the pillars of your fourth yeah. pillar is understanding etiquette and business etiquette. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you share with students? Is it around email etiquette, like etiquette at business lunches? Uh, what are just some tips that all professionals can keep in mind as they're sure. uh, trying to expand their uh, executive presence in that way? Sure. Uh, well, all of what you just mentioned, for sure, right? There's, um, well, one etiquette on, you know, how do you how do you function within the office, right? Um, we've, we've, we all have experience. We've seen good examples and bad examples. And I share that with them, right? You know, we're in a environment today where 
when I first started out, there was no such thing as casual dress days. <laughs> we were all in white shirts, suits, ties. That was it. We couldn't even bring a McDonald's bag. Uh, with the logo into the lobby, right? We'd have to eat outside wow. if McDonald's. That's going back 30 years, right? So it's, it's a lot different. So, um, but that doesn't mean you, if you have, if, if you have casual, it doesn't mean you come looking disheveled, right? So, you know, making sure you have a crisp shirt or it's clean, ironed, so forth, right? No one's asking you to spend a ton of money on a wardrobe. It's just looking the best you can. That's one type of thing. Um, business travel. Right? If you're traveling uh, by yourself or with a team, one, you're representing the company while you're on that trip. So you need to make sure that you're behaving as a representative of the company, right? That means treating you know, desk agents at the airport kindly, even when you're frustrated with delayed flights. You know, it means you're obviously treating the client appropriately, um, but you're you're behaving as a representative and ambassador for your company. That's another area. Oh, email etiquette. We could spend a whole hour talking about email etiquette, Iman. Uh, but one, just a one quick thing I, I do try to import, uh, one thing I do impart with this particular topic is in my experience, if you're sending an email back and forth, and, and a lot of students today are very comfortable with texting and you know not talking face to face or virtually face to face with someone. If you're sending an email back and forth and you've sent at least two emails and there is a misunderstanding or a confusion, stop. Get on a call with them, whether it be a virtual call or a cell phone call or walk down the hall to their office. Just stop because 98% of the time they're just misreading what you wrote. You may not have wrote it clearly or they're just taking it a different way. And it's easy to clear up with a great um, relationship between the two. If you keep going with these emails, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. That's enough. But then also, you know, when you're hosting meetings, there's, you know, you have to have an agenda. I, I can't tell you how many times I was on meetings where it just seemed to wander and say, why are we here? Right. First of all, don't call a meeting if there's not a purpose. Second of all, have an agenda, follow the agenda, be very clear, engage everyone that needs to contribute to it, have an objective for the meeting and don't and end the meeting once that objective is met. You don't want to have loose ends there right now, of course. There might be if someone can't attend, et cetera. So there's, you know, those are, and then uh, again, the you know, dinners, right? If you're going out with clients, um, you know, it could be a formal or an informal. If it's a, if it's a formal, there's a very, you know, the, the biggest thing that kind of scares folks that are not used to more formal settings is, okay, I'm going to wait to see who takes the water because I don't know what side it's on, right? Just something as simple as that. So. I share with them the BMW approach, right? Bread, meal, water. Just think of the car BMW when you sit down. If that's all you remember, don't worry about the forks and stuff. Just bread, meal, water, right? Simple. But also, you know, you you've got to you know, you, you've got to also understand when you're traveling with maybe your boss or with team members, um, you know, and there's different philosophy on this, right? Is that when you're traveling, you're it's work, right? You're not just always watching movies. There's a time for doing that, but you're not just always watching movies or playing video games on your phone. You know, it's better to get work done, right? You're there on business. That's what you're you're being paid to do. There's lots of prep work to you know before you land and you get to your destination or whether you're on a train. So use that time effectively to work, um, and and it demonstrates your commitment to the project to the company when you show that you're doing that and you're not just worried about, you know, uh, getting a soda or something else, right? So those are the kinds of things, just a sampling of what we try to get into. And and then I give, you know, every one of our workshops, Namont, has some type of involvement from the students. So it's never just a lecture. It always ends with some kind of case, right? Or, or getting them involved with, how would you handle this in this situation, right? From a from a standpoint of etiquette, as we're talking with, or does this is this an example of executive presence, or is this one an example, and why, right? 
So it's not, it's, it's very active, not just passive, right? They have to be involved. They have to think through what they're hearing and what they're learning uh, and try to really internalize it. We haven't discussed this topic before, but our guidance is very, very much aligned. Uh, th- those are some of the same things that, that we're sharing inside of our, our corporate trainings, inside of our trainings with our university partners. Uh, and it, it's amazing, uh, even professionals who have been working at the top of their field for 10 or 15 years, uh, sometimes they just don't understand the effectiveness of short, structured, clear meetings and and how to send an email that's going to gain the buy-in and motivate the action and align the team in the way that you need it to. Uh, and these are just some of those really basic skills that end up being not so basic when you're in the real world. Mm-hmm. That's right. And and also, you know, what I am starting to also help the students realize is when they enter the workforce, and this is part of etiquette, that they're going they're in a virtual world for the most part and they're going to be working with team members across the globe you need to be culturally aware to be able to be effective right you you just can't even if you were in person you just can't go to germany and try to be an american manager right or go to japan and try to be an american manager you need to understand you know how to uh not how to be more effective, right? And there's lots of different uh, programs out there. One of the things I learned at Accenture was, um, um, what was his name? Gert Hofstede's um, Five Dimensions, right? And that has always served me well. I couldn't probably remember a lot of what I learned way back, you know, that many years ago, but I still remember nuggets of it, you know. Uh, I remember one time when I was in India and we met with the, the entire development team and the leads were communicating and the team members weren't. But if you talk with the team members individually, you got a lot of great information. Well, because they were not going to, they, you know, they had the respect for their lead to be able to communicate to the project lead, right? And if you don't understand that, you're expecting a different, um, a different situation. You're not going to be as effective and be able to communicate individually with team members to get their perspectives too. Um, but just being culturally sensitive is very important in today's world. Outside of cultural sensitivity, which I think is even today very underrated, is there another underrated skill beyond the ones we've talked about today that you think all great consultants possess? Yes, um, and this changes as you progress up, but since we're talking about focusing on, on the university students, I'm gonna keep it at that level. When you're starting out, whether you're an MBA or whether you're an undergrad, you're not gonna be leading the company, right? So you're, go- you're gonna have work and you're gonna be deep in the weeds. One of the things we try to impart is Yes, you need to be deep in the weeds. That's your job. But stick your head up and make sure you understand the the uh, uh, the landscape. Don't ever lose sight of the bigger picture. Because if you if you do, you may be wandering and miss the miss the target. But if you understand the landscape and you're not completely devoid of it, you're going to be more effective in working in the weeds and more effective in communicating the interpretation of all that, what you're doing in the weeds to leadership with, which doesn't want to know about the weeds. They just want to know about what the landscape looks like, right? I think that probably applies to to everybody, even beyond consultants. Oh, absolutely. Understand the why behind your work and be as hypothesis driven as you can be at all times. Mm -hmm. So talking about Talking about GW specifically, so beyond Consulting 360, which is an amazing program, uh, what else sets uh, the School of Business apart uh, for those who may be considering pursuing an MBA to eventually go into consulting? Yeah, it's a great question, Iman. So uh, GW's business school has a very strong and is known for its international focus. And I think that draws a lot of 
students and MBAs to, and we've got a number of different MBA programs, global MBAs, accelerated MBAs, online MBAs, et cetera. So, um, but that is an important f- aspect of why they're looking to at, at GW. So that international is, is important. The entrepreneurial, uh, the, I'm sorry, the experiential aspects, not just consulting 360, but there's the consulting abroad program. There's the short-term abroad programs that make a big impact in actually applying your skills and, and the knowledge you get from your education in other countries, right? Getting to, again, the etiquette, right? So now if you're in my program and you're a, a second year MBA and you're going in the consulting abroad program, you've got a much bigger tool belt and tool set to be able to bring and be effective, right? And they all learn a lot when they come back from those programs. So, so that's another one. The MBA programs are also infused with a lot of ethical leadership, a corporate citizenship, and then a global perspective. And that that is another important aspect, I think, to why they would want to look at GW. And lastly, we have an urban campus in the heart of DC. And uh, we're in our nation's capital that gives them access to a lot of resources and uh, and network with the faculty, have a lot of contacts and come from industry and many of them. And, and that's invaluable to kind of have that at your doorstep. And there is a unique charm. So I would say definitely take a look at GW. Having lived and worked in DC in a prior life, I can 100% second that there is a unique charm to being based uh, in DC. Uh, there are a lot of folks listening to this conversation, Joseph, who are considering an MBA program and are considering a life in consulting post MBA. Do you have a couple of tips for them as they're considering whether this is the right time to pursue an MBA? And as they're sifting through their program options, is there a framework that you would recommend they use to make that decision? Yeah, and, and I've had folks talk. To, uh, I've talked with with folks and coached them on this as well. And it's really a something we would tailor, right, it's, it's to to each individual because it's a very unique decision everyone has to make. And I've, you know, I've seen, I've seen people that had do not have graduate degrees achieve the highest levels within consulting. Uh, I've seen the reverse too. People with graduate degrees achieve the highest level. I've seen individuals go back for graduate degrees and it's helped them. And not the degree itself, but what they've learned from the degree, right? Just by having the three letters after your name didn't make them get a promotion, but what they added in value to the company after getting it surely did. Um, But I've also seen folks with MBAs from great universities that just, didn't make it, right? And those from smaller universities that really did. So it, it is, I say that because there's no one path or right answer, right? The first thing I would say is, is if, if someone is considering, is this, should I go back for an MBA? Is it the right time? Do I need it? One, look at where you're at, right? Do you want to leave your company? And that's why you're thinking about it. If, or do you want to advance within your company? Well, if everybody who's advancing your company has an MBA and your company values that, that's an important thing to note. And if that's the case, right, or if it's the case that you think you need an MBA to be able to to get other positions outside of the company if you want to leave your company, okay, fair enough. Then this might be the right time for you to get it. But you have to assess where you're at if it's the right, if it's if it meets your career goals first. Secondly, are you committed and do you have the time to accomplish it? Right. And which kind of program or which university affords you the right uh, delivery method, right? Is, do you want to do an executive program, an accelerated program? Uh, do you want to do a full-time program uh, online? How, how, what meets your particular needs? Of course, cost is another important important uh, aspect to it. And then the program's culture. Every program's going to have a different culture, just like a company. Where do you fit best, right? So I think they would need to answer those questions for themselves. And then the right universities will sort of filter through if they're truly 
self-aware and, and making sure they're honestly answering those questions. They'll decide if they need to go back or they want to go back. And then where's the best home for them uh, and based on their particular situation. Lots of wisdom there. Thank you, Joseph. Well, one of our one of our traditions here at Strategy Simplified is to end our conversation with a couple of personal questions. Sure. And I learned something about you uh, preparing for this conversation that I did not know, and that that is that you were on the 1982 championship football team at the University of Georgia. Uh, and so I have to know, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that experience and maybe a favorite memory from that year? Oh. We're going 40, back 41 years now at the WAD, but there are there are definitely memories I have, um, a number of them, but there are really two that really stick out as something memorable. And I'm looking at a picture in my office here uh, of of one of those those times. But the first one would be the very first game that my very first game at Georgia was the first game of my first year, and it was. The, we were playing the defending national champions, Clemson Tigers. And you remember William the Fridge Perry was on the team. Future, you know, uh, went to the Chicago Bears with one of my teammates from Georgia and won the championship there in 86. The, um, it was the first game in Sanford Stadium at home. It was the first game of the season, so it was televised, the first college game to kick off the season. It was a night game, and it was the first time in Sanford Stadium that they had lights. They had mm. just put them in that summer prior to the fall uh, season beginning. And running out of the tunnel onto Sanford Stadium and between the hedges with a home crowd cheering, I don't think I'll ever forget that feeling and that moment. Uh, the other one, which is a, a little bit different one, was... Uh, we were preparing for one of our games. I, I don't recall the team at this point. And I was, I was playing, I played defense. So I was running opposition defense for our starting offense. So I was, I was, I was in the middle linebacker position. It was a running play to the left side of the field, which I had read and stepped up and made the play. And I started getting cursed out by all the coaches well, I had tackled Herschel Walker. And I, you know, and, and of course, he was a major asset, right? That you don't want to get hurt in practice. So I, I realized right away, okay, you know, where am I where I am on the pecking order, I guess. <laughs> you realized really quickly what the team's priorities were. <laughs> Joseph, right. I have to say that's that has to be a a really just bucket list moment, right? How many people can say they've tackled Herschel Walker? Right, whether and, they were and teammates you're alive. or not. Yeah. <laughs> and you're alive to tell the tale. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Uh, Joseph, our, our conversation today has been chock full of career advice and just lots of fantastic tips for young professionals. Uh, with our audience, which is primarily young professionals, 18 to 34, is there one piece of career advice that you haven't yet shared in our conversation today that you would just leave us with uh, as we end our conversation? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I speak with a lot of employers and I always ask them, what do you see as the biggest challenge you have with college students coming into the professional world, right? That, that you would want to improve upon. And I'll, I'll synthesize it into these two components that is pretty consistent across humility and patience. Uh, a lot of young people have great ambition. That's great. You got to have that. But they expect to have what they want, the project they want, the promotions they want, when they want it. And that's, yeah, we all may have that, but they don't know how then to voice that to their boss or talent lead or whatever and whatever they call it in that organization that you talk to about your career growth. And a lot of times they approach it inappropriately, right? They, they, so I would say as a, you know, things that I haven't already talked about that you need to really be humble. That doesn't mean you can't be effective, speak up, you know, be innovative, 
But be humble in that, you know, you're going to be assigned a project. You're not going to necessarily have a choice all the time of what project you're going to be assigned to, but accept it, learn from it, do the best you can shine there. If that's not where you want to be and you want to navigate somewhere else within the organization, that is perfectly fine. But there is there is a right way and a wrong way to be able to raise those concerns. And the right way may get you there a lot quicker, right? Uh, another thing we tried to teach our students, but I would leave that with your students. And I would like to emphasize that, you know, build a skyscraper. Joseph Miranda is a senior career consultant and the Consulting 360 program manager at the George Washington School of Business. He joins us from his office in Falls Church, Virginia. Joseph, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure, Damon. Thank you so much.